So yeah, my name is Ben. I'm all about residential and I'm not an engineer, I'm a technologist. My background is in telecommunications engineering. I've been all over the industry. I started off in network expansion for Telus Bell Rogers for 4G in their highly saturated areas and then moved into product development with SAIT. So I went and got uh, applied research grants from various different government organizations to create products for Canadian businesses. And then from there, I joined one of those companies working on capital projects. And so Virum was incubated by General Electric to try to trillion dollar a year waste problem in, uh, in capital projects, building dams or oil refineries. Like the bigger it is, the more waste there is because the more we re rework there is. I got to play with robots and drones and LIDAR and virtual reality. So that was really cool. When I moved out to Vancouver four years ago, I joined a company that made an indoor air quality products. I didn't know how badly my life was affected by poor indoor air quality until I had joined Haven. My dad has COPD because he was a science teacher that was exposed to chemicals for 30 years without any kind of proper ventilation. And then my wife who grew up here in Bedford, she went to school in a building that had so much mold in the basement that you had to wear rubber boots to be able to go to the bathroom. So air quality became something that was really important to me. This was before the pandemic started. It was an interesting story arc of how Haven became a thing. Back in about 2017, our founder was an electrician working in hazardous job sites. And he wanted to build a wearable indoor air quality monitor that would tell him if he is in danger or not. And so he got some grant funding. The Kickstarter created like a wearable prototype and was working with researchers to determine the viability of it. They ran out of money for that particular sphere and then they switched over to residential HVAC because one of their advisors was just like, man, let's just put it in the vents. Like the air is always moving up there because they created the solid state particle detector. So it uses a specialized integrated circuit that they have patents around to detect bidirectional flow and to use that to tune the particle detection algorithm. Almost all air quality monitors for particulates that are out on the market, it's a tiny little fan that's integrated that's just pushing air through a small orifice. And then because it's such a well-controlled environment, it's really easy to make that work. But Haven went the hard route and spent years creating this product, which is the central air monitor. And then we also created a secondary product, which was the, the controller. So the indoor air quality controller has two solid state relays that over wireless, all, they connect to the cloud. The cloud does a lot of data interpretation. It determines when to interact with the controller to turn something on and off. So like a very basic version of building automation for HVAC systems. Because home HVAC systems, a lot of HVAC systems, they don't have accessory controls to do humidification, dehumidification, or calling for ventilation or auxiliary filtration. So that's the market need that we are filling with this. But the path to market that we went is through residential HVAC contractors. And while I was at Haven, I had an epiphany that residential HVAC contractors can't even do HVAC. We had invested so much time and money to try to get to market using residential HVAC contractors. And it was a lot of friction to get product adoption because best practices are not common for residential HVAC. The amount of contractors I called in Canada to try to find local collaborators to be like, hey, could you help us with doing a deployment of this product? And we just need you to show up to the site and we want you to have a couple of tools like a combustion analyzer. They're like, a, a what? A, a combustion analyzer? There's a furnace here that we want to analyze if it's working properly before we put our device in it so that we can get some benchmark of what's going on. And so my mind was a little bit blown there. And my mind was blown by this situation. Because of COVID, homeowners started caring about indoor air quality but the science they hadn't caught up to the interest in indoor air quality. So you have a market that is unregulated comparatively to commercial that has a lot of people with interest in trying to make money. Does anybody know what the drama that happened with electronic air cleaners during COVID? Okay. Part of it, yeah. Ozone and other, and other things. So this lady right here, Marwa Zatari. She is an ASHRAE fellow and she's on the USGBC. She wrote an open letter to address the use of electronic air cleaning equipment in buildings. And that letter got a huge amount of attention by professionals in the industry. What it meant is that all these contractors that are slamming in these electronic air cleaners are saying that, hey, look, this product is going to kill COVID. 
it's gonna, like you sell it to homeowners, it's going to make them feel safe. So sell as many as you can, because here's an amazing spiff. Let's incentivize the crap out of this. And the cost for making those types of products was in the tens of dollars, and they are making insane margins on it. And so these companies became wealthy and profitable. She wrote this letter and got a $160 million lawsuit against her. The lawsuit just got settled, and she took down the letter. So this was mind-boggling to me, even before this happened, this whole situation, because this was only in the last couple months that the letter got taken down. But this really started shifting my, like, holy crap, there are so many market forces at work here. It was very curious to me that this was happening. And then I've even had a couple conversations with Dr. Siegel. Why isn't air quality something that's a lot easier to solve in residential? And he also had a problem being able to talk about it because he's also spoken out and he's got lawsuits against him that really affected his livelihood as well. So that was a turning point where I'm just like, oh my gosh, I don't know if specifically trying to solve indoor air quality is something that I'm going to be spending time on anymore. I want to, I want to be able to make more of an impact. That's when I started thinking about just residential HVAC in general. What I have here is just an example. I think this is a residential building, sorry. But it's a fancier one, that, like it has architectural drawings, 3D models involved, and there were plans, there was a whole bunch of conscious effort, and probably engineers involved in this. In residential HVAC, that's what residential HVAC is in comparison to commercial HVAC. And I'll go into it in the following slides. And what I've discerned, at least this is my opinion, is that there is a whole bunch of market forces at work. Residential HVAC is stuck in a Wild West situation. There's a lower density, there's lower amount of stakeholders that are involved in making decisions on your mechanical systems. The cost of doing things, there's no economies of scale because you don't have multi-res. You can do everything at once, so you can hit an economy of scale. That doesn't happen. Every building is one-off, and a lot of contractor relationships after the build of, let's say, a subdivision, it's all one-off work. F f putting the mechanical systems and the duct work into a bespoke home. And a lot of times, there, there is no engineered drawings. There, there is no load calcs. A lot of people have been even faking load calcs because there is no consequences to, to do otherwise. <laughs> so I kind of went, okay, 50,000 foot view. How do regulations work in this type of market? This is what I had pieced together from all my research, is that you have the ICC, who kind of works together with ASHRAE to create codes and standards. And then those trickle down into the ACA manuals. There's a variety of ACA manuals that an HVAC contractor follows in the residential HVAC space to create the outcomes for homeowners. And uh, Energy Star is also a part of this because they take their guidance from the ICC and then they provide additional guidance towards homeowners and to contractors. That's kind of how it all plays out, the checks and balances of the market. It, it works fairly well for creating good outcomes in a lot of situations. Even though there's guidance that's provided at a state level, it is the municipalities that enforce code compliance. And that code compliance, it just depends on what's the incentive for the municipality, how many resources does a municipality have to enforce those codes and those standards and in a lot of smaller communities, none. I talked with a lot of contractors, they say that the building inspectors don't show up or else they just don't care in a lot of smaller communities. And then on top of that, the disparate climate zones create for some really difficult, like a lot of these contractors who aren't very well educated, you can't give them resources that are universal. Some of the contractors that I talked to down in climate zone number one down there, down in Miami, they have to make up a lot of their, like Jenry Garcia, he has to dive through ASHRAE standards to figure out how to create a solution for his particular climate zone because what he does down there in their really super hot humid climate zone doesn't, it doesn't work throughout the rest of the continent. As far as the building stock in the US, one of the really interesting things that the DOE found in some of their studies was that 70 to 90% of homes have a fault that was caused during installation that will adversely affect the performance of that system. And if you take ductwork into consideration, it's almost at 100%. Because commissioning is not a thing in residential HVAC. Thus, you have all these systems, almost every single one of them has a fault that's going to cause a problem down the road. A lot of these groups, the Building America program, Pacific Northwest, DOE, they're all putting a lot of effort. Like, holy crap, this is an epidemic that we have to do something about. When I first started doing indoor air quality, I got connected with all the home performance nerds. So like the passive house people, the high performance groups that are doing really interesting work. 
but I found that they're so insular in the impact that they have. All these pilot projects and showpieces that come out of these groups, they stay pilot projects, they stay a news article, they stay a journal publication. Like, the builders aren't doing that stuff. There's a very small amount of learnings that end up getting integrated into the majority market from this, these like fringe groups who they are doing the right things, but what they're doing isn't accessible to the rest of the market. Corbett Lunsford over here, he has a great TV series on PBS that helps bridge the gap to say this is what a, a high-performing house should be. And he has some really cool stories and workshops and training to help get techs up to the next level. Except that like what he has here, all these accessories, that is absolutely not commonplace. That's not something that normal technicians use or care about. Moving over to HVAC contractors, the businesses that exist to solve this problem. Running an HVAC business is really difficult these days because there's so many shortages of labor, <clears throat> equipment, parts. Like COVID made it so that there'd be like month-long waiting periods for equipment or parts. And... <laughs> Sorry? Yeah, some of them a year. Yeah, the shortages that you, that on, on the commercial side, you guys faced all those in commercial, same thing happened in residential. And for them, they have all these additional circumstances where the culture in residential HVAC is very blue collar and it's a little bit abusive. It's difficult to be able to find really good people that want to stay because long hours are expected, hazing is expected. It's just not a very positive experience for a lot of people that want to join the workforce. And so the homeowners get really bad results. They get the short end of the stick because of all these problems that a contractor face. And that isn't even going to go into what the HVAC technicians themselves face, where kind of good enough is the accepted norm. Some of those rules of thumb, beer can cold, oh, I'm just going to swap the capacitor. Those are memes for a reason because a large portion of the market, that's how they roll oversizing equipment is just normal because nobody wants to put in the effort. It takes a lot of effort, it takes training, it takes resources to make sure that the equipment's the right size. The envelope is not something that most HVAC contractors think about and they aren't incentivized to deal with. Get into that in just a bit here. The fact that there, there is no incentivization for them to go outside of the equipment, a lot of them, if they're just doing an equipment swap, they don't even think about the duct work, let alone the envelope of the entire home. <laughs> These shifts, these challenges for techs, and the speed in which the technology is changing, and the new equipment is so sensitive compared to previous equipment. PSC motors used to be the norm before, and then a lot of homes that have been switched over to ECM motors, these ECM motors are failing in within the first couple of years, and an insane spike in warranties because the techs, they're just doing a swap, like, oh, that's the same amount of tonnage, just pop it in, and it mostly works the same. No, again, no commissioning. Commissioning is not a thing. <laughs> and another component of this, I'm not as familiar in the commercial market, but in the residential market, you have, is two-step familiar to you guys? Two-step distribution? Like, it's actually four-step. It's not two-step, but they call it two-step distribution. What it is that the manufacturers, they employ third-party sales reps to be able to represent their products. And then the third-party sales reps go to distributors to do a matchmaking exercise to be like, hey, look at this product that I'm peddling. And then the distributors then buy the products and they warehouse them. And then the contractors go and buy it from the distributors and then the homeowners get it. So they call it two-step distribution, but it's really four steps. Back in years past, they used to provide a lot of value to the market, both sales reps and uh, distributors. But especially since COVID, and even before COVID, there was a complacency that was building where they would just cash checks because they had a territory and they knew that somebody was gonna buy from them anyways. And so they stopped providing value for the industry. So sales reps stopped providing value. And then the distributors, COVID really threw their business model for a loop because contractors and builders started going elsewhere. And on top of that, technology is now moving so fast that the distributors who used to be experts on universal parts, they used to be able to be the kind of like local expert host, like, yeah, call me and I'll be able to tell you what's going on to help you solve this problem. Now, the, some of these systems are so complex for residential and the distributors haven't kept up with the technology and the training that they can't offer those services anymore. And so it's kind of, it's created this rift. Some of the contractors and even the manufacturers I've talked to, they're just like, yeah, we're just sidestepping distribution now because it's, it just works so much better. And then there's manufacturers who are just off doing their own thing. They're trying to make moats for themselves and they're abandoning the universal parts paradigm that used to be the norm. So because when you make all these highly complex systems, you have now 
opportunities to define what your system is doing in software. And software, oh man, that can now make a very tightly coupled system. And so a lot of them are meaning very well by being like, okay, so with our type of equipment that works this way, instead of having a subpar interaction with the accessories or between the indoor unit and outdoor unit where it's just triggered via 24 volt, everything's becoming communicating nowadays and it's not following a standard protocol. So BACnet is a thing in commercial. This is like pre-BACnet where we're seeing proprietary protocols, black box al algorithms and non-serviceable parts in the field. And a lot of these manufacturers too, they have exclusive arrangements with their contractors. So if you're a Daikin certified a DCP, then you get access to all their resources and you get all the preferential treatment. But if you're not DCP, like with a lot of their equipment now, you can't work on the equipment. So a lot of gatekeeping is happening. So I'm just kind of going through a whole bunch of stuff here. So it's probably a lot to absorb. Incentive programs, I got some great feedback that almost every incentive program for on a large scale has never worked. Like the Green Deal in the UK, it failed spectacularly. And it had similar hopes and goals as what the IRA program is doing in the US. A lot of people I was talking to, they were very passionate about the IRA program. It has a lot of, a lot of good pieces in it and means very well. It's basically like just a massive influx of cash to accelerate greenification of homes, to solar installations, heat pumps. So heat pumps are the thing that's going to impact homes the most through this IRA program. And unfortunately, these programs, they don't include things like dehumidification, like in 80% in of the population in the US and also in Canada is in humid climates that need some dehumidification. So the IRA program doesn't deal with that. And it doesn't deal with a building envelope. They're incentivizing a specific type of outcome, which heat pumps, yes, that's a good thing. But a lot of these heat pumps, you now have more expensive air leaking out of your home instead of less expensive air. And then cr price gouging is a huge thing. So like a lot of the equipment now, because it's new equipment, so it enters the market, it doesn't have a benchmark yet. It hits the market and then the prices are already just skyrocketed because they know that the incentive program that the homeowners can get, they just eat the rest of it as profit. Well, any, everybody within the two-step system are increasing their prices because of incentive programs. And the brand that is heat pumps, is going to become even more ruined than it was in the 70s and 80s. Because in the 70s and 80s, heat pumps, they were available. The technology, it wasn't as good, but the installations were wrong. They were not being done properly. And so that really just tarnished the reputation of heat pumps for decades. So now we've had a new push to be like, hey, the new technology is good enough now. And that's absolutely true. It is good enough, but the market's not ready for it. Be, because the workforce isn't trained on how to properly install them uh, and the envelope isn't being considered. So heat pumps are being put in as hotcakes right now all over the place, which is good in some ways, but it's going to be very bad because ductwork isn't being considered, load calcs aren't being done, the building envelope is not even being thought about. Some of these people that have provided this information, they are just so mad at what the US is doing on this. And then on the Canadian side, just as an example, our grid is not ready. The US grid isn't ready either, but our grid isn't ready. The amount of heat pumps, the, what is it, like kilowatt additional capacity for every home at peak is what heat pumps are going to add. So maybe on average, maybe it's more like five kilowatts. I want to kind of connect these dots to my background at Vero. Who here knows what the whole drama around the Site C Dam in British Columbia? or Muskrat Falls here in Nova Scotia. You're familiar? We are very bad at building grid capacity. So Site C Dam is one of those things mm -hmm. that living in BC, like it just kept on ballooning in scope more and more like the budget multiplied by multiple factors. The deadline keeps getting pushed. That's one of the things I found out with working with Virum is that the bigger the capital project, once you hit a threshold, it's almost like you were gonna double or triple the budget and double or triple the timeline. And then even then, you probably still won't hit the design that you wanted. So that's a problem because we're just not going to have capacity for all this greenification that we want to do. Just expanding on a little bit more is that as far as the numbers go, we need to be retrofitting 1,200 homes per day to be able to hit our 2050 targets. There's barely any capacity to do projects for retrofits in this country. Not even province, country. <laughs> And existing technicians, they don't know what they're doing. New techs aren't being trained properly. 
and nothing is incentivizing builders to make all these new homes net zero. The new building council here in Nova Scotia has not had executive leadership for three years. ABC, yeah, green building, green cap. Yeah, and so there, there's nothing pressuring home builders in this province to build green. <laughs> and this one was, is a really interesting trend that I, I haven't considered until I saw this happen with my work with MeasureQuick, is that private equity is entering the construction world and it is eating everything. This is good and bad because you have your really sloppy private equity and then you have your really strategic private equity. It's going to create a market where there isn't going to be small contractors anymore. It's all going to be medium or large, and they're going to be multi-regional or national or sometimes across all of North America. This is, it is happening right now down in the U.S. There's a feeding frenzy where a lot of companies are being bought and all of their processes are being gutted, and then they're being replaced with a standard operating procedure that in some cases is really good because the standard operating procedure is measurement-based, in some cases, it's just a sales-based standard operating procedure where it's just sell as many boxes as you can in your local market because now this is just a numbers game. It's not about looking after people. But again, that's for the sloppy private equity, not all of them. Just another trend that I don't know if you're following what's happening with ChatGPT. Who here has used ChatGPT? Who here has used MidJourney? I've been able to replace an entire creative team by using a combination of ChatGPT and, and MidJourney, which is like creating copy with generative AI. It is a stochastic parrot that seems like it is artificial general intelligence. So what that means is that you can go to ChatGPT right now and be like, hi, ChatGPT, I want you to be my therapist. So these are the specializations that I want you to focus on. I want you to actually focus on CBT, so you know, cognitive behavioral therapy. Okay, now let's go. Here's my problem. And it will be your therapist. And there, there is so much happening in this world right now in the world of tech, which is, that's my background in tech startups. There are thousands of companies being formed right now to try to use large language models and generative AI to replace a lot of knowledge workers. <laughs> so a lot of people that they either do creative work or uh, other kind of repetitive tasks, now it can be handed off to one of these large language models, which 95% of the time it comes up with something that's entirely factual and like better than what you get out of a lot of juniors. 5% of the time it hallucinates. <laughs> so when it hallucinates, it, it can give you some really insane content that's not actually true, but it's creating a cultural shift in our society right now. And on top of that, people are stringing together all these tools the Unity game engine now is being used by these generative AI startups. There's a cool video where somebody created a mod for Skyrim where you now can have the characters in Skyrim or any other video game that pulls in this data, you can have any conversation with them and it'll never be the same type of conversation. It is going to be all unique. And so with, with this, what's going to happen, it's going to solve a lot of the training like when techs are in the field, so many of them don't have access to the information that they need to be able to solve a problem. And so they're calling their senior techs, their service manager, they're calling their, even the manufacturer or a distributor to try to get help. This is going to be a big shift where these kind of tools are gonna be AI assistance for the techs in the field. That's gonna happen in the next couple of years. Then there's a recession. And what they're saying <laughs> with the recession is partially due to some of those technological advancements is that this is gonna be different than any of the previous recessions in that the, it's gonna more affect white collar workers instead of blue collar workers. Because the blue collar worker, they're doing all these tasks that you can't hand off to an AI. So I, I don't know what's gonna happen there. I'm not an economist, so I'm not gonna to speculate too much. So what now? There's a lot of stuff that seems pretty bad that's happening here, but I am seeing solutions that, some of them are completely new, some of them have been happening for years which I just wanted to shed light on. And this is the whole reason why I've started my consultancy is that I call it Teal Maker. And it's because I just believe that this is what's happening right now. So just a little play on words, little plug. But if you haven't heard of any of these guys, these are people to really look into. Well, you know, you know probably ACA. NCI is a really interesting organization that they are creating a clan of expert technicians that are really incentivized and hyped to be able to do the right thing. TEC makes some really interesting products. They have this thing called a true flow grid. 
how it can be used in both commercial and in residential, but it's this grid of holes that's able to give you a cross-section of the airflow in the ductwork. And then there's Measure Quick, which I'll tell you a little bit about, and HVAC School, who they make a lot of really cool content. If you haven't heard the HVAC School podcast, absolutely fantastic. Brian Orr is a gem that I've worked with in the past. What I'm also seeing is that there's, there are frameworks that are emerging that are trying to take a lot of the best practices from ASHRAE, from ACA, and distill them down into digestible pieces that allow the average technician to be able to access them. So just even the simple guidance of like load matching, filtration, dehumidification, fresh air, balancing, and humidification, like the things that you guys all know how to do on a regular basis, techs don't know some of those techniques. Some of them have never installed or never even considered a humidifier or dehumidifier because it's been outside of the scope of what they've needed to care about as a residential professional. And there's a lot of really interesting groups out there on, on Facebook or creators on YouTube that are organically popping up to create a community, to create a critical mass of everybody talking about best practices. If you want to see more about what the cutting edge techs on the front lines care about, those are the groups that are talking about it. And lots of YouTube creators that are popping up trying to educate the typical workforce, because a lot of these guys, they don't have access to classroom training, and they would prefer video training instead of being able to sit down in a classroom anyways. A couple of software startups I've, that I've been chatting with, XOI is an interesting platform, how they're trying to unite all of the infrequent app experiences to pull them all under one singular kind of experience for apps. So in, if you, instead of you using 52 different apps to be able to do your job, a lot of contractors, they end up being burdened with dozens of apps because each contractor will train like the carrier, like they all have different apps to now interact with their equipment instead of a singular experience which adds a whole bunch of friction. So XOI is solving that. Duckling is trying to solve the problem with the, the, homeowner, in, the homeowner contractor decision-making process so that it makes it a lot easier for homeowners to make the right type of decision for them to consider the building envelope or the duct work as a part of the upgrades that they'd be doing to their house. And so like adding a software layer to make sure that the contractors don't have to worry about that problem. Conduit's a cool one, how it's just a, using iPhones and iPads, it uses the LiDAR scanner to be able to create a 3D model and then to do a load calc based on the 3D model of a building. So then there's the new flat rate and HVAC 2.0. They're building flat rate selling solutions for contractors because again, contractors are not trained to sell very well. This is just more or less that you guys can go and look at all these solutions and understand a little bit more that there is a whole bunch of organic movement to try to solve some of these challenges. But some of you might have seen that I have a shirt that says better HVAC on it. So this is a something that I've been just poking at for the last couple of years, which is to create a decentralized movement that takes all of this disparate work of like gives everybody a, a flag to fly so that they can unite their efforts together. I've taken some inspiration from the open source communities and the maker movement. Maker spaces are really interesting groups and buildings that have shared tools and really curious people that are just building really cool stuff. So the open source and maker, the maker movement, they're more just guided by principles of that information should be freely available. It should be really easy to collaborate with other people and it creates a lot of very fast innovation. And so that's where Better HVAC, I've just mostly been poking it along to be like, okay, let's just find some of these people that are all doing the right things and connect them all together by using a loose framework instead of a prescriptive framework. And the whole point is to make the pie bigger so that all these groups, all these manufacturers that are trying to do it well, to just like somehow create some cohesion so that the rest of the market, they now have something clear to follow. Because it's not really well organized, all these initiatives, all of these influencers and that all these leaders are doing. And so I hope that Better HVAC can be this uniting factor in the residential space because it is just such a mess. The current HVAC market, like there are so many technicians that are completely burned out that just want out of the industry and owners that want out of the industry. And the industry is 97% men and no LGBTQ. So it's not diverse. It is very homogenous. But the new generation that's coming in, Gen Z, is antithetical to the existing blue collar culture. I don't quite know what's going to play out there, but hopefully something like Better HVAC can help bridge the gap of all of these leaders that are doing something really cool to still down what they're doing into something that's relatable for a newer generation. One of the other things that I'm working on is to find contractors that are doing it right and then to use them as an example to create case studies, testimonials, training materials 
to give them over to the early adopters in the market. There's a book called Crossing the Chasm. If anybody's read it? In a market, when you're introducing new concepts, you have your early adopters and innovators, and then there's a chasm, which is very difficult to cross with a new paradigm. And then there's the majority, the late adopters, and then the laggards on the other side of the chasm. And so taking the examples of the people that are doing it right, like I, I'm working with some contractors and with one of the clients that I'm working with to create all these stories that then can trickle through to take the majority market, which I call the walking dead. If they see the rest of the market is following best practices, to become more profitable, they're gonna to have to change their ways or die. So that's the goal of what I'm doing with some of the clients that I'm working with. And that's also what I am seeing is a possibility with private equity. The better private equity companies are, uh, are very results oriented and they're measurement driven. And so if you could take something like MeasureQuick, which it's a commissioning platform for residential HVAC that does end-to-end -end benchmarking of a system. It tells you exactly what's wrong with it and then spits out uh, a really easy to read report. It keeps all the records of, of what happened during every single service call. I have seen examples of a couple different business leaders that are now buying companies specifically because they're using MeasureQuick. So an Aikido move is what I think could happen. This is just a theory that I wanna pursue. I don't know how successful it'll be. And so if you don't know about MeasureQuick, that's what it is. It's this kind of, it is the only commissioning platform for residential HVAC where it, you can basically connect dozens of tools up to it, manometers, electrical equipment, vacuum gauges, and all sorts of different things to get all of your diagnostics just spit out for you. So you just hook them all up, press a couple buttons, follow the procedure, and now every tech is at the same performance level. You don't have techs that are left behind anymore. And what followed was another half hour discussion, but my camera died. If you made it this far, it means that you're interested in better outcomes for your HVAC related business, your service team, your customers, or even your own home. While the challenges that I explored in this video might seem overwhelming and you might not feel like you have an influence over what's going on, you still have your voice. You can have better HVAC discussions with your colleagues, your friends, your builder, or your contractors. And I hope to make more better HVAC content in the future. You can discuss what other topics you want to have explored or explained in other videos via the comments below. Thank you for watching.